Yeah, I want to try to sort out that uh, that issue of the 12, and I think it can be sorted out better by just taking one narrative. Sometimes when you take parallel narratives, you, you lose the thread of the different ones. And what I was trying to point out, if you look at Matthew 14 quickly again, first we have, uh, you know, Herod's birthday party. Uh, to my mind, a big joke. But um, why is it a joke? Because uh, who cares about birthday parties in this period of history? The Romans, the Romans, that's all. They're the people who care about birthday parties. The Jews in Palestine are not interested in birthdays. It's not one of their traditions. Uh, it becomes one later on. But this is a Romans uh, because of the different gods and goddesses and various astrological things. Uh, birthdays were very big for them. But anyway, we went over that. Jesus goes to a deserted place, goes to the wilderness to do signs. And uh, he's going to feed the people in the wilderness, like Moses fed the Jewish people in the wilderness. Uh, uh, there's all those overtones that the writer is very well aware of, um, if the reader isn't. And he saw a multitude and he healed the sick. There's Jesus as Asclepius healing, healing the sick. Remember I told you about Asclepius, the god of healing for the, uh, for the Hellenistic, Greco-Hellenistic world. Jesus the healer. Uh, this, this is just automatic. He, uh, he heals people, as you know, endlessly. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be cruel, but we want to look for the historical Jesus in these things. And if Jesus were, if someone were such a healer, we'd probably want to send him all over the world and get on to India and get all that leprosy worked out there and uh, get down to Africa and do all the AIDS, too. Because uh, I wouldn't want to just satisfy with a few people out in the crowd here. In any event, uh, we want the history, and that's why I'm cruel. Uh, I don't mean to be cruel. But if you're going to separate history from uh, legend, mythology, other sorts of uh, you know, Greco-Roman god tales, um, and a certain amount of the Old Testament, I mean, I don't know Elijah, how much healing he does. Uh, a little bit maybe, but uh, Moses does a bit of healing in uh, in the uh, Miriam episode. Not, not, it's, not a, um, it's not a central focus as it is here of each episode. In any case, so they have the crowds, and then there's a problem of eating. So this, since this is a, more of a bourgeois episode than a, uh, a desert episode, Jesus sends... Um, his disciples into the town to, to get some food like you would do out in the Death Valley or someplace. And anyway, there isn't enough, so he broke the grave and gave the loaves and the disciples gave them to the multitudes or the rabim as Qumran would put it. And they all ate and were satisfied. I, I keep a note on words like satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of pieces that were left over. So that was 12 baskets after they broke off. So, in fact, there was more left over than what they began with. Or, that's not, I'm totally clear. And there were 5,000. Okay, so we've got that. Then Jesus goes to a ship, and um, he calms the sea, and uh, Peter tries to do the same, but Peter sinks because he doesn't have enough Pauline faith. That's uh, the rest of chapter 14. Chapter 15, I hope Peter didn't drown, by the way. Um, in chapter 15, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees come from Jerusalem. And we know that the, the code name for scribes and Pharisees often. And again, we have this material about the, the, why do your disciples violate the tradition of the elders? And we find out, first of all, that the reason you should not wash your hands at a meal is because your parents didn't. And that ultimately the scribes and Pharisees are out of their minds because they uh, want people to wash their hands before eating. Uh, we know who wrote this, and we've already been told that for the purpose of newcomers. I just uh, mentioned it, you know, and so on. But we know who wrote that kind of material. Certainly, overseas uh, people in the Greco-Hellenist world who didn't understand uh, um, Palestinian Judeo um, cleanliness uh, rules and found them to be um, a little bit um, 
overburdensome and therefore, uh, uh, you know, peculiar and rather laughable. I mean, can you imagine telling a, a Nero or a uh, Tiberius or um, Caligula that, uh, that it was a good idea to wash his hands before he went to eat? Oh, I wash them after I eat. If I dirty them with the food, why should I wash them before I eat? This is ridiculous. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I'm saving Jesus. I mean, no believer laughs at Jesus. That, that we know. Uh, but I'm saving Jesus from being laughable. And I think Christians should thank me, in fact. Because, uh, okay, they don't take it, they don't seriously do what I'm doing because it, it's not in their, you know, it's not, the believer shouldn't do this. It, it would be hurtful and painful. But on the other hand, I mean, for historical Jesus, if you want to find, I'm not going to saddle him with this episode. Because uh, my Jesus, or your Jesus, or the Jesus I think uh, was out there, um, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't say such ludicrous things in the interests of a plumable debate. That's, that's my own opinion. Kill me, shoot me, do what you want. Okay, that's interspersed, as we saw. I'm going to come back to this in a minute, because we have the Canaanite woman that we didn't deal with yet. But okay, then we come to the second. Uh, baskets, uh, loaves and fishes episode in Matthew and Mark. And I'll come back to it in a minute. And Jesus and his disciples said to him, Where will we get so many loaves, line 33, in the wilderness? And then the word satisfied, the crowd. And he, he doesn't send him into the town here, but basically it's the same thing. How many loaves do you have? Seven, and a few little fish. And he commands them to come there to take the seven loaves and the fish. They break them, and we see. It's a total repeat of the previous one. So we see how our editors are working here, not very carefully. In fact, some, sometimes the material gets totally confused and bouncing back and forth from one gospel to another. But the point I was trying to make last time was that when they, there are 4,000 here instead of 5,000, which is why the editors may have said, well, we better include that too because it's a different episode. There's only 4,000, not 5,000. Uh, but the point being that in Josephus, the numbers 4,000 and 5,000 bounce back and forth too for the number of Essenes, for the number of, uh, of people who follow um, uh, Alexander and I is out into the wilderness to resist the, um, the Seleucid takeover. I can't even, it would be worth cataloging all the four and five thousands in Josephus so you can uh, convince yourself of and the antiquities and the uh, version of how many Essenes there were and so on and the pseudo-Clementine recognitions, how many followers of James there were. It bounces back and forth between four and five thousand always. Uh, I think Josephus at one point says there were four thousand Essenes and so on and so forth. So, but the, the, the editors here really uh, are, are not, um, you know, uh, don't really understand what's going on. And they took up the seven baskets full of broken pitches that were left. There were 4,000 men and children. So they have seven baskets here that were left. And then, finally, in the recapitulation of the whole thing, because the next editor in chapter 16 knows that this is all a mess. At least in Matthew and Mark, he knows it. And then he has Jesus saying in line, um, first of all, it starts out with the leaven of the Pharisees material. I don't know if anyone's ever gone through this material in this manner. I'm sure you've never heard anyone go through this material in this manner. It just occurred to me over the last two years while I was writing my book, when I began to see these things, and I sort of like my eyes popped out of my head. And I've taught this stuff for 35 years and never seen it. So that's how difficult it is to see. So don't be surprised that, you know, it doesn't jump right out at you. Look, again, you wicked and adulterous generation. Poor people are always being chastised by their Savior. And the Pharisees are tempting him, you see. Tempting the Pauline Christ, that is. Not the Jamesian Christ, because the Pharisees are, in this, in this code, as I've tried to tell you, the James party. And why? Because Acts says some Pharisees came down from Jerusalem and said, unless you were circumcised, you cannot be saved. Acts 15, 1, the beginning of the Jerusalem Council. And it's so obvious that those are the messengers in, 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 in Galatians sent by James, the party of the circumcision. So that's how you, 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 you figure out the Pharisee uh, symbolism. 
because the regular Pharisees are not interested in Christian missionary work or Messianic missionary work. They've got their own little uh, world going on in their schools and things. They don't come down to uh, Antioch and hassle the Christian community. These are Pharisees within the Christian community. And Acts tells you some Pharisees had joined the Christian community. In, in their view, as if, the, as if, in other words, the Christian community was originally Paulinized, but then it got Jamesianized. No, the progression is Jamesian and then Paulinized. So they retrospectively flip it over. That these are latter day uh, 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 joiners because the real Jesus is Paul's Jesus. Anyway, you, you, you can uh, play with that in your mind. I, I've worked on that already with you. But anyway, so the Pharisees come down and, 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 uh, and look at them. There's the usual thing, hypocrites, that is so important. Uh, hypocrites uh, take the, um, the sky is red and gloomy, hypocrites, don't you know? And of course, the hypocrites is from where? Galatians, Paul's attack on Peter and Barnabas. Uh, you know, this is an, uh, this is an adulterous generation. Oh, wicked and adulterous generation, you know. And when the disciples came to the other side, they forgot to take the loaves. And Jesus always bawling the disciples out, bawling uh, uh, Peter out, because they don't understand the true message, which is Paul. And Jesus said to them, watch, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. That, we already had that before in the toilet bowl episode that introduced in the previous chapter. And they reasoned among themselves. And it's because we brought no bread. And knowing this, Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith. Again, same thing as he said to Peter when he sank into the Sea of Galilee. Falling faith. Why do you reason among yourselves? Because you brought no bread. Don't you understand? Don't you remember five loaves and five thousand how many baskets? And uh, seven loaves or four thousand how many baskets? And how is it you don't understand? I don't speak to you about bread. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not saying to be aware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Oh, the penny drop genius. But the point being here is that the writer understood that there's a, uh, you know, I think he understands, in my view, that there's a problem between those two episodes. So I said, forget the mess of those two episodes. The main thing I'm telling you is beware of the teaching of those who are wishing you to observe dietary and purity regulations. That's the teaching of the Pharisees. So that's what I meant to say, that, um, that um, at one point it was seven, at one point it was 12, and then Jesus dismisses both of them. Oh, stop, stop. Someone must have pointed out, look, you got a problem here. And, no. and I was trying to say that I think that the seven came from John's uh, portrait of these things, because John doesn't double it up. I don't think so. If you look at John 6, now taking the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, harmony or the um, concords, whatever you call it, that yours is called, uh, your, your parallel lined uh, uh, edition. If it's Passover time, and we get the money, the 200 penny worth of things, and there are five barley loaves and two fishes, he's got the seven right there. And um, they filled it up and so on and so forth. Well, um, I guess it's from the five. No, I guess I don't get it. But I'm still in the same pickle here as far as where they got the seven from. And I guess it was because John added seven here at some point, but they all have seven, don't they? Anyway, I'm still back in the same mire there, so forgive me. I can't, I can't without a lot of more reading it myself, figure it out. But let me go back to Matthew and forget that now. Um, you can work on those episodes, see if you come out with the same thing that I come out with, and uh, you may not, which is fair enough. But let's look at the intermediate material, because we've got to move on, and it's really important. So, okay, let's go back to Matthew 14. Let's stick to Matthew, unless there's a problem. Uh, in, uh, Matthew's more detailed than the other Gospels in this, on these matters. So, um, First we have uh, Jesus walking on the waters, right? Because he went into a ship and went up on a mountain. Uh, is that parallel than the other ones? I don't have it in front of me. Is uh, Jesus going to a boat? Uh, yes, you've got it in Mark, right? And you've got it in John. Let's turn over the page, so it makes it so difficult. Uh, and um, 
Do we have the attack on Peter here? Are you of little faith? No. That's not the parallel. I think. Am I right there? All the external trappings of the sea storm and walking on the water, but the attack on Peter is in parallel. Is, is that correct? So that's, that's interesting. I don't know. I don't, that's not common. It doesn't mean anything except the person here in Matthew is laying it on. The attacks on Peter. You see, but when he saw that the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, saying, Matthew 30, 31. And immediately just Jesus took out his hand and said, Oh, thou little faith. There we go again. The usual motif. The usual motif. Oh, thou of little faith. Why did you doubt? Oh, you communities listening to the James people. Oh, Peter, you swing figure between the two. Why do you doubt salvation by faith, not works of the law? It's grace that brought the... I always think of that song. Can any of you sing that song? It's killing me here. It's grace that... Give me one line of it, will you? Are there no singers, no choral masters here? <laughs> Come on, you know. Amazing Grace, you know that song. Anyway, it's a lovely song. I always bring tears to my eyes. I'm, a, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm always touched by things that are better, sentimental and, and lovely. So it's a beautiful song. <clears throat> so anyway, you see how attractive the Grace Doctrine actually is just by seeing a song like that. You know how, well, God, that's incredible. If I can be saved by nothing I do, but by God's grace, I'm in, I'm in tremendously good, good hands. That's wonderful. So it is terribly attractive. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking it at all. Okay, so in any case, the attack on Peter here is missing from the others, and I think uh, it's a Pauline attack. And they, by the way, and then, uh, when they were gone up in the boat, the wind ceased, he quiets the wind, I guess, and they were in the boat, they worshipped him. Worshipped a God-man, never fly in Palestine. Never fly in Palestine. I call it Palestine. I want to call it Judea or whatever because I don't think it was called that uh, Judea, perhaps. But I think it was basically called that's a Roman province, Palestine. And I don't mean modern Palestinian Israel issues. And of truth, thou art the Son of God. All these doubters, all these naysayers who say God doesn't have a son. This is all after the Son of God doctrine, even as is put in here. So you say, when was this edited? I don't know. There are layers upon layers of material here. These people who try to date the Gospels are out of their minds. Unless you give me a paradigm of the whole Gospel, I can't date this. I don't know when the different layers got, you know, you follow me, inserted in this particular Gospel. I can maybe some of the materials you might want to put early. Some, I don't, when did the Son of God doctrine come into play as the final one? I think not until the second century. Uh, so, uh, you know, and they are worshipping him now. But, Read Greek tragedy. I, I love the Bacchae woman. They're always falling down and worshiping Bacchae as a god, Dionysus as a god. Oh, we didn't recognize you, sorry. Fall down and worship him. It's all Hellenistic writing, unfortunately. And so we're just trying to tell us, well, what am I trying to say? It's not the historical Jesus yet. You mean there is no historical Jesus? People say, no, there is an historical Jesus. But this is the Hellenized Jesus. Now, if you think the Hellenized Jesus is historical, fine. Boltman said, listen to the proclamation of the early church. Fine. If you're looking for personal salvation, fine. This is your Jesus. That's good. Nothing wrong with that. But we're doing this properly. Okay. So, I mean, you can do every line like this, and I don't want to. But let's go now. Uh, um, so, um, truly thou art the Son of God. I think that's, that, is, that is really a, a, a great little uh, climax to this. Notice, by the way, they call the, the, the lake Gennesaret. You see that? I think that, that that's also Gennesaret. Lake Gennesaret. That is what it was really called in Josephus, if you look carefully, Gennesaret. Uh, not the Sea of Galilee. Some, once or twice, if you notice, they call it the uh, Lake of Tiberias. Because Tiberias is the Roman city. That was built by Herod, uh, named after the Emperor Tiberius on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. But I think the Jesus of Nazareth type of show comes from that Gennesaret uh, 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 word, ultimately. You mean it doesn't come from Nazareth? 
I don't think so. Personally. Why? Because in the Gospels, I don't know if we have time to cover this. After Jesus' early introduction says that he goes to, to Nazareth, and then Matthew quotes some scriptural passages because uh, Galilee of the peoples have seen a great light and he uses that to justify why Jesus goes to Nazareth and so on. And there's no, there's no indication of a Nazareth as a city in Josephus in Galilee at this time. You say, what do you mean? There's nothing in the Bible either. Uh, often holy cities spring up to meet the demand. I mean, I went to Nazareth several times, and you don't know how many local Arabs were taking me to Mary's well. But they were all different wells. You know, they wanted their, their tourist guide tip. So when a pilgrim comes from Spain or Rome and has come six months to get there, can't speak the language, it's like being in Baghdad, an American soldier, and you're dependent on your translator or your guide. I mean, he can take you to anywhere and say, this is it. And it can spring up that this is it, you know. Uh, Nazareth needed to be there, ultimately. Now you say, Did it, was it there? I also see that uh, at one point Matthew, and I can't get back to you for a moment, uh, says that, uh, and he shall be called a Nazarite. That is the, uh, that is the basis that he's uh, trying to put for the Nazareth. Uh, locale. I think this is an ideological designation, Nazarite, not a, not, not, not a geographical a place of origin. And as the writers overseas try to comprehend all these things, they come up with the city of Nazareth. Now, I may be wrong, but first you're going to have to demonstrate to me that there was a Nazareth in the first century. And uh, I see no indication that there was a Nazareth in the first century. Now, by the second or third century, yeah, yeah. Once the belief took hold, the city, the city arose, or the town, or the village, or the place. But the point is that I don't think, uh, I think that really comes from Gennesareth here, the name of the Sea of Galilee, and the other side of it is the Nazarite, and I think James, Jesus, John were all Nazarites. And as this got, you know, transmuted, to me the Dead Sea Scroll community are a community of Nazarites. That's what they really are. Dedicated to God. Nazareth means dedicated to God. Uh, and part of the thing is to keep away from things. Lehinazer, it's a reflexive verb based on NZR root. And if you notice when James gives his instructions to overseas communities in Acts 15, he says, keep away from this. Keep away from blood, food, things, sacrificials, etc. In the Damascus document, it's always used the same word, Lehinazer. Uh, linsor, to keep away from, keep away from this. As I, I, in my translation, in uh, um, the Decisicles of the First Christians, I give three examples of where it says to keep away from, based on the NZR root. So the NZR root is very important to the scrolls, as it is to the James community, in my view. And I think a lot of that comes from, James is clearly a lifelong Nazarite, and more, and John is certainly that, and I'm sure Jesus was too. Uh, no doubt that if we can find Jesus, he has to be. These guys didn't have it wrong. Between John and James, if there's a Jesus, then he's not going to be, a, 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 you know, Paul. You know, Paul didn't even exist at this time in Palestine. It's a, a Romanizing transformation. In any event, you have to decide that. I'm just giving you the arguments uh, for what about Nazareth? Finally, there's another uh, uh, thing. Nazareth actually is based on a different root than Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth is a TZ in Hebrew. And uh, you see, uh, in Greek, it, it will be transliterated probably the same as Nazareth. I have to check it out. But TZ versus Z. It's a Zion versus a Tzadi. How many do Hebrew in this room or have done any Hebrew? It's a different letter. Uh, Z versus I know it's hot talk, but it's a totally different. Sadiq is TZ. Uh, uh, Sadiq is TZ. You think of the one that um, Zion is just Z. It's hard for anyone who doesn't know the letters in the uh, Arab Greek uh, framework to, to picture that. And certainly, someone 
in the Greco-Roman world would have no idea about any of these things. Now there's another thing. Um, there is, um, there is uh, the Netzer, the Netzer, the branch, that's TZ. That's a messianic ideology coming from a lot of scriptural prophecies. So then you have the word that came out and developed in Hebrew and in uh, Greco-Roman translation, Jesus the Nazarene. That doesn't mean come from Nazareth. Jesus the Nazarene does not mean. It's really Jesus the, when you usually see it, it's Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus the Nazarene. It can mean Jesus the branch if you want to do the teasy, or it can mean Jesus the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the Nazarite if you just want to do the Z. Or it can mean Jesus the keeper. Uh, the keeper, linsor et habrit, to keep the covenant. And there's another, uh, uh, I know it's a little bit complicated for you, but there's another um, uh, synonym for this. We have two synonyms. Linsor, the root is there. This is the, the L is the infinitive. N Z R is the root. And then you have lishmor. The root is S H M O R to keep. Shomer. <coughs> I'm Shomer Shabbat. I keep the Sabbath. Shomrei Abrit, keepers of the covenant. The sons of Zadok in the community rule are twice designated as the Shomrei Abrit, the keepers of the covenant. Those priests who keep the covenant. It comes from Ezekiel 44. I show give my uh, temple over to those who keep my covenant, the sons of Zadok, and I'm going to get rid of these other priests who let foreigners into the temple and uncircumcised people and so on. Read Ezekiel uh, 44 uh, and the behavior in the new reconstructed temple, and you'll get the whole basis for the keepers of the covenant as the definition of the sons of Zadok at Qumran. So also, Notzrei uh, Habrit uh, is the parallel To Shomre Abrit. Which is keepers of the covenant. They're both keepers of the covenant. Anyway, it would behoove the writers of a gospel of this kind to confuse that issue, whether it's Shomre, Notzre Abrit, keeper of the Brit, or the Nazarite, to make it a geographical designation. Often, as I said, that's done, and we'll see it in John. And the first, the first miracles are done where in John? The marriage in where? I think it says uh, Cana of Galilee. Is that what it's called? I'll go back to that in a minute. Cana of Galilee. I'm going to go back to John in a moment. Cana of Galilee. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, I, the Cana is, is, is in there, but Cana is... Cananean also in uh, some of the gospel lists of the apostles, but Canaim. That's a, a Hebrew letter, that one, Canaim. Canaim. Or no, it's an uh, pardon me, it's just the other one, it's an Canaim. Zeal for God. Zealots. Cana is zealots. And also interesting enough, Galileans in um, church literature are zealots. Judas the Galilean is the founder of the zealot party. So the Galilean party is often a, um, a, uh, a, a synonym for the zealot party. So Cana of Galilee, to my mind, is also a double synonym. A zealot kind of notation transformed into a geographical location. Now, in my mind, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, I have to go to that thing. But that's another example of watch the geographical locations. Remember, if you know your Gospels, when Jesus is on trial in the synoptics anyway, and Peter is out warming himself by the fire, and uh, the Roman soldiers, or whoever they are, come and ask him, do you know this man inside? Are you one of his uh, companions? I hear you speaking uh, Galilean or something. And he says, uh, no, no, I'm not a Galilean. No, I'm not a Galilean. I don't know him, or something like that. 
But he denies being a Galilean, not just denies Jesus, I think he denies being a Galilean. I don't remember the episode. You'll, you'll test me three times. Now, the question is, is that a geographical location or the identity of a sect of, uh, of Zealots? So this transformation of names uh, of groups into geographical locations is very uh, widespread in these uh, materials. Now, how accurate it is or inaccurate, <laughs> you know, none of us were there. You have to determine. I'm just throwing it out to you as something that you need to uh, pay attention to. Okay, so that's enough about the Gennesaret then. I think, again, if you're looking for the origin of the word, the geographical rotation, Nazareth, it is Gennesaret. Can I give you one last thing on that? If you look in Eusebius, the early church literature, you'll find a tradition, I think it's from Julius Africanus, that the Messianic family came from two towns. That the descendants, the Dispasinoi, you know, uh, in the early church literature that Eusebius calls, and he's good for what he calls, as a person, he's a complete maniac. Uh, Dispasini, I think it is, anyway. Right. Uh, actually, our word despot comes from that. It's a Greek word, but it means the family of the Lord in this sense. The, the, the Lord's family, the, the Lord, despot. We get the word despotic from it, but the, the, that's not how he meant. So the um, the despotini are the Lord's family, and he says afterwards, Herod burned all the debt records, because uh, no, the genealogical records, because he was jealous of the Messiah, whatever, whatever the truth of that, I don't know. And so on, he didn't want, um, Herod, Herod may have destroyed the genealogical records because he didn't want the Maccabean family to uh, survive, but I don't know if he was jealous of the child Jesus yet, but in any case. Um, but the Lord's family did have its records and did be able to, you know, take themselves back to David's family. This note says, I don't have it in front of me. You guys have been reading uh, uh, Eusebius and Classes probably have it. And uh, again, it's from, I think Julius Africanus. And they settled in two cities. He doesn't identify where these are. Nazareth and Kokhava. Kokhava, or it can be Kokhava. You know, it depends how you, B's and V's are interchangeable, depending on how you uh, accent them. Well, Nazareth means shoot. That's a messianic uh, notation. Kokhaba, Kokhaba means star. They settle in two cities, star and sh the star and shoot cities. These are very messianic uh, expre expressions. Now Nazareth may have developed Nazareth may have developed out of this Nazareth place, wherever that was, and I have no idea where or where it was. Um, Eusebius by Julius Africanus, a second century writer, implies it's in Judea proper. But who's the general leader of the next generation? Bar Kokhba. Right? Well, that's normally taken as a designation, son of the star. And perhaps based on the star prophecy, right? Star will rise from Jacob, scepter to rule the world, never forget it, number 2417. Okay? Now, does it come from this town? Did Bar was the Bar Kukpa one of the descendants of the Despotini out of the town of Kokhab? Did he actually come from Kokhab or Kokhab? I don't know. I put in my book a place near Jericho that was normally thought of as being Kokhaba, where there's a, a famous um, Greek Orthodox Christian monastery, a very early date, uh, called the Monastery of St. George, which is around 4th century uh, Greek Orthodox monastery. And there's a picture of it in, in my book, in the picture sections, if you, the, the New Testament code, if you, if you buy or get a hold of that book. Um, and it's, uh, it's still there. Uh, it's one of the oldest uh, monasteries in existence, 
and uh, I think these monasteries grew up on places where these bands were uh, flowing up. So it wouldn't surprise me if this was uh, where Bar Kokhba came from, Kokhba, the leader of the Second Jewish Revolt, the Messianic leader, clearly. I'm sure he made Davidic claims. We don't have as much about Bar Kokhba. Why don't we have as much about Bar Kokhba as we have about Maternal and Josephus? The Romans killed, them. killed everybody, yeah, but this time there's no, no Josephus survived to tell us about. I mean, you know, Josephus was a total rotter, as we discussed, and traitor, and, you know, sycophant, and uh, yeah, just the worst sort of human slime. Uh, but he has some redeeming qualities. <laughs> you know, he's proud of his origins and proud of his people and so on, even though he wanted to toss in the towel. There are a lot of people like that. A lot of people like that in the Holocaust, unfortunately. When you're up against the wall, you do you do weird things, or you do un what seem unseemly things. But he survived, and we have to be grateful because he gave us this encyclopedic uh, uh, presentation material from this prayer. But we don't have anyone from the Bokovka prayer that that gave us that kind of We don't know all the details of the Bokovka uh, uh, matter. We just have a smattering of materials about Bokovka. Okay. So that could be, and the last thing about that, if you look on your maps, and you look at the Palestine-Israeli fighting in southern Lebanon, one of the strongholds, and then more recently the, uh, whatever that, uh, Hezbollah, Army of God, uh, basically stealing all their ideas from the Old Testament Dead Sea Scrolls anyway, but then they fight the Old Testament Dead Sea Scrolls people, you know, that's another example of turning the, uh, people who started these ideas, turning their ideas against themselves. It's another, but you can't tell the Muslims or the Hezbollah or any of these people such things because they cut your head off. Because no. <laughs> uh, their ears, uh, <laughs> Jesus didn't come along to unstop them yet. But um, they don't want to see anything pre Muhammad. But uh, basically, they're just picking up the most extreme ideas from this period and, uh, and uh, still uh, embodying them, quite unfortunately, I think. Uh, be that as it may, uh, in the center of southern Lebanon area where most of, a lot of this is going on, you look at your map, you'll see a town called what? Kalkaba. 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 And Kalkaba in Arabic is just Kokhaba in Hebrew. Kalkaba means star in Arabic. So there is actually a town in southern Lebanon called Kalkaba. I can't know what to make of it, but it's there. And sometimes these towns go way, way back. I don't know how far back, but sometimes go. So there is actually a town called Kabul, Star Town. Don't tell the star people uh, or these cult people who about this. They might all go run and you know try to uh, commit suicide and go to the next uh, uh, dimension or something from there. I don't know. Okay. So that's uh, so we're getting in now to uh, uh, chapter. Um, they cross over Gennesaret, and they brought more diseased men, and they touched the hem of his coat, and they were all perfectly well. To my mind, all those touching episodes I told you come from that one episode in Jerome, where he says that James was so uh, holy that the people tried to touch the hem of his garment as he walked by. Now, uh, where he got that, he got that from the people of Jerusalem, obviously, that they remembered that. And I think all that, these are variations on that. I may not be, may not be true, but uh, anyway, Jesus is certainly God-man, Dionysus, Escopas walking around. And maybe a few other gods like uh, Osiris uh, thrown in. I think the combination would be Escopas, Dionysus, Osiris. Or Horus, because uh, you have to throw the Egyptian materials in too, because a lot of this stuff comes, I think, originally from Alexandria in Egypt, where people were purveying this material uh, because of certain problems that uh, the mission to Gaius and Philo uh, points out. Now we did all this. The scribes and Pharisees come down from Jerusalem. Why do your disciples violate the tradition of the elders? So we did all that. The tradition of the elders, the Pirkei Avot in the Talmud and so on and so forth and we end up with in Matthew anyway uh, do not don't you understand you jerks 
everything which enters the mouth goes into the belly and is thrown down the, uh, you know, again watch those in Greek, uh, cast forth, ek balate, down the toilet bowl, ek balate in Greek, which I like. Uh, this is line uh, 15, uh, 17. Ek balate, if you notice who, when Josephus talks about Essenes and they, they expel backsliders, they ek bala, they expel backsliders. To my mind, all that kind of language revolves. You've got to watch all those usages. That's why you say you need a Greek parallel New Testament. They can pick up, not for every word, but the important words, like all the casting out words. Now we have Jesus withdrawing after he, uh, and, uh, look at it. Um, the things that go forth out of the heart, they defile the man. And, uh, you know, these murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, lies, blasphemy, these are things defile a man. But eating with unwashed hands does not make a man unclean. Oh, my. That, I think, really is a toe stubber, as I told you. Maybe the others are bad, but we all now know that eating with unwashed hands, I'm not talking about clean, uh, what we're seeing for. Uh, murder, adultery, that's not uh, uncleanness, that's just uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, guilt, guiltiness. But uncleanness, yeah, un eating with unwashed hands is unclean. So, you know, it's just the opposite of uh, what we would uh, know that is proper health uh, procedures. And by the way, I don't myself eat with, un with the washed hands at my every all the time. In fact, I'm a very bad boy. So I'm not advocating this because I love it. I'm just advocating it to show you what it means. Anyway, off he goes into uh, Lebanon. Go to Tyre and Sidon. So he goes into non-Jewish areas. And a woman of Canaan came to him. Lord, son of demon, my daughter is miserably possessed by a demon. This is parallel, I think, in Mark, isn't it? Let's see if we can get the parallel here. Uh, yeah. Um, God. So where 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 is the parallel? That's Matt. Okay, Mark seven twenty four. Let's see. We will go to the parallels. Um, is grievously vexed by a devil. Uh, one says, and Mark says, importantly, unclean spirit. That's the point that I think is really good. It's an un again carrying on the uh, the the cleanness issue. And she besought him that he would then cast forth a demon. I think it's demon, not devil. Uh, what do you have, demon or devil? Demon, demon yeah. Uh, we can look at the Greek here. That's why, you know, but the, so you get so confused because one you have parallel, the other's going straight, so it's so hard to find. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Where, what is it here? A Canaanian woman came, and my miserable possessed by, yeah, a diamond, a diamond, a diamond. Demon. Uh, and fell down at his feet. The normal thing to do to Hellenistic gods. Now the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by race. And she besought him that he should <coughs> cast forth the devil. There's the casting language again. Uh, God, what, what's Mark? Give me Mark so I can quick get my finger in. Mark 7, what is it? 24. Huh? 24, 26, 27. Yeah, uh, ekbalai again. You see, it's the ekbalai of the uh, cast down the toilet bowl thing. But it's not, you see, it's so interesting because it's not, that's why people say, why is your book a thousand pages? I try to analyze all this stuff because it's not in Matthew, I think, at that point. Matthew's using a different word. Because Matthew used ekbali in the toilet bowl thing, and Mark didn't, I think. So now Mark picks up the ekbali in the casting out the demon thing. All usages of casting down, casting out, etc., have to be cataloged. And I say, I give you the reason of my work. Because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the destruction of the righteous teachers expressed in terms of the word bala'a. Bala'a. They, they ate him. They, uh, they consumed him. They destroyed him. And um, Bala in Hebrew is 
used in the destruction of the righteous uh, teacher. And uh, in my view, this parallel in Greek is, uh, is balo, ekbala, and all its variations in Greek. And I'm not a great expert on uh, Greek. And it has to do with Essenes casting people out, James being cast down the temple steps by Paul. That's also balo, and lots of other casting down language that you, that you find in the, in the uh, but I do a better job than one of my articles. I post it online. Noel helped me get that up online there because she's been helping with the website. And it's uh, the final proof that James and the righteous teacher are the same. And I do it on the basis of this bala, uh, balo, uh, uh, parallel. Uh, both have to do with the devil. You see, diabolos in Greek has to do with casting against. Dia is against. Balo is against. And, and, and Belial in Hebrew has to do with swallow. So both are, de uh, are the roots of devilish words. And it's very complicated. I, all I can, it's very much more complicated than people think. These people are really geniuses who are working on this material. They're not foolish people by any means, though they stumble as we see. And I don't think, you have to be uh, uh, pretty smart to, uh, to follow the ins and outs. You say, oh, you're just imagining it. No, no, I don't think I'm imagining it. But if you think I am, that's fair enough. Anyway, let's go on here. Uh, swing back and forth to Matthew here. Send her away. But he answered, I was not sent but to the lost sheep of Israel. Um, and he said unto her, and Mark, it's different. Let the children first be filled. Watch that filled. Watch the filled. In Luke, we're going to get the parallel. And the poor man, Lazarus, under the table, longing to be filled. Watch how they, these words float. Now, the average person doesn't even pay attention to words. He's more interested in the meaning. I've gotten beyond the meaning. I don't even pay attention to the meaning. I'm interested in the float of the words. To see what... Uh, anyway, let the children first be, uh, be filled. Uh, 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 in Matthew, he says it differently. It's not correct me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Line 26. Now that I can follow here. It's again bala balon cast. It's the bala language. The bala language cast. But he says to the little dogs. Kunar, uh, kunarios. The little dogs. I think, uh, I don't know if you have it. Little dogs or just dogs. But it's little dogs. Both of them are little dogs. But they do it different. Let the children first be filled. But her retort is great. She's got the great wise guy retort. Yeah, even the and we love this. I mean, this don't we all love this? Everyone loves this. Even the dogs eat the crumbs. Uh, eat of the children's crumbs under the table. Watch that language. Eat of the children's crumbs under the table. Matthew has it differently. See why you have to put them both together and watch them? Every word is absolutely important. You have to watch it like a hawk. So, not parallel, then not surprisingly in Luke or John. But she said, Yea, Lord, even the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Right? We're going to encounter this again in Luke, but in a completely different sense. That's the key to how the Gospels work. That's the key to everything, in my view. Which is why in my book I have one chapter called uh, Do Not Throw Holy Things to Dogs. And then I have another one, um, I used to have it titled uh, Even the Dogs Eat the Crumbs Under the Table. Um, and so on and so forth. When, where does Jesus say don't throw holy things to dogs? Or uh, pearls to swine, for they will trample them with their feet. And I'm very important to watch the feet imagery. Where is that? <coughs> Matthew Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, something or other. Or 7. So, Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5 to 7. Not parallel in the other gospels. We haven't done Matthew Sermon on the Mount, but it's there. If one of you go back and can find that for me while I'm going forward, we'll, we will read it. I don't have time to, to shuffle back. Find it for me and we will read it. Because these are all a cluster of materials. Read it. Oh, okay. When the person refers to read it, you know. Uh, 
Uh, these are all a cluster of materials. So let's go back to Matthew here and cast it to the dogs. And then he says in Mark, let's go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And she went and found the devil that the demon had gone. And he went to the borders of Tyre and Sidon. And he uh, came into the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the borders of the Decapolis. Well, my friends, who's ever writing that has no idea of Palestinian geography. <laughs> you don't go from the borders of Tyre and Sidon uh, to the Sea of Galilee through the, through the Decapolis. You go from Tyre and Sidon right to the Sea of Galilee. You don't go around, uh, you know, or maybe that, that's just the route he took to do a lot of uh, curing and stuff, I don't know. But, you know, you, <laughs> the Decapolis is on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, out in Jordan, as far as Ammon. It's called the, um, I forget how many cities of the Decapolis, I guess ten cities, because it's Decapolis, the ten cities of the Decapolis. Ammon, you know, Jerash, Pella, uh, I can't name them. I've got pictures of a few of them in my book. But look here, in, um, in Matthew, what comes into play again? Oh, woman, great is your faith. There we go. You're totally colonized. You know, I, I'm just overwhelmed by your faith. Let it be done as you will. You think Jesus is going to ch change his whole program if he's only going to the house of Israel because a woman makes a clever statement to him? And that's what this is presented as being. And who's found that uh, don't cast holy things to dogs yet? You got it? Yeah, that's 76. Right, read it to us, will you? Oh, you lost it again. <laughs> you need both here. You need follow you. Yeah, no, I know, don't follow me. <laughs> do not give, do not give dogs who are sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the swine. Say it again. Do not what? Throw your pearls. No, the first one. Do not give dogs what is sacred. No, do not give holy things to dogs. Okay. And do not throw your pearls to swine. Yeah, go ahead. If you do, they may trample them under their feet right. and then turn and tear you to pieces. Okay, so don't go, give, don't cast or throw or give holy things to dogs. But now, the upshot of this is. But even the dogs eat the crumbs under the table. Nice retort. So we have a double, a double Jesus here. A Jesus who says you shouldn't throw holy things to dogs, and a, then a Jesus who is caught up by a clever Canaanite woman's retort. This is directed against the, towards the Gentile mission people to, to, to please them and so on. And then, of course, Jesus concludes in Matthew. That's why... When people say Matthew is the most Jewish of the Gospels, I say no, that's really, that is not true. In any case, um, all this is in between our feeding episodes, don't forget. The feeding of the five and the four thousand and the final recapitulation of that. Uh, oh woman, great is your faith, let it be done, and her daughter was healed from that hour. Jesus departed and came nigh the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on a mountain there. Uh, see, now here... He, he, it's not the same as Mark. He goes, uh, Mark has him go to, through uh, the borders of the Decapolis. And the great multitudes came to him again, the lame, the blind, the dumb, the maimed, many others. These are all the banned groups of people from the temple in Jerusalem. Because you couldn't go into the temple with these sorts of uh, problems. So now uh, these are the people writing this know this. They're conciliating these groups saying, oh, that's nonsense. And they cast them down on his feet. Here's the casting, again, I think, used again, and uh, again, and the feet. I think it says that I have to look at the Greek. Let me look at the Greek. What's, uh, what's the actual uh, line here? 30. And let's say, uh, let's see, 30, 30, 30, 30, the dumb, the name. Uh, let's see, look at the Greek. It says flung. Yeah. No, this is not, uh, this is not casting. This is another word, flung them down his feet, but the feet is there. So we, we, gotta, we always have to be careful. Uh, keep these things, uh, it's not bala, it's another parallel route. It's much as the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb speaking the blind, the main pole, the lame walking the blind, seeing, and they gloried the God of Israel. These are the mighty wonders and works in the gospel. Uh, in Mark 2, they bring the deaf and so on, they lay him at his feet, and, uh, and things progress from there. Let's move along now. Uh, and then in Matthew 15 and Mark 8, we have 
the second feeding episode, which continues on to the explanation of it, um, and which is the condemnation of the leaven of the Pharisees, right? But if you go back uh, to Matthew 15, in the middle of these things, and he called the multitudes in line 10 to him about the dietary laws, and um, the Pharisees were offended, and Jesus answered, and so on and so forth, it's another one um, saying, basically, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. I don't have uh, the actual quote here. I'm not sure if it's, in, uh, if it's in Mark or not, but I don't have time to do that. I want to go over to Luke 16, which I submit to you is the parallel to what we, uh, to what we just read. And that will take us over to John. Next time I will pick up this material in John. Okay. Just uh, by the by, we're, I like, always like to look at the ambiance here of things, and um, uh, I don't see anything. In Luke 15, tax collectors and sinners came to him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained. Always they're complaining. This is tax collectors and sinners, to my mind, I told you, code for Herodians. The Herodians are the tax collectors. And of course, who are the Pharisees? Code for the James part. This is 15. I'm looking at the ambiance of 16. Uh, I have to move on. Chapter 16, he said to his disciples, a certain rich man had a manager. These are economic parables here about uh, baths of oil and unjust manager parables uh, um, about these things. And in my book, I don't have time to show it to you now, I told you that the Nakni bun the rich man, one of the people who fed the city for 18, 20, 30, I forget how many years before the fall of the temple, put the uh, things in the granaries, also made rain. Uh, certainly not an historical uh, person who did those things, though he may have been credited. A very, very rich man. He fills a certain number of cisterns with water for the temple. And he borrows the money from a rich lord to do this. I forget, uh, I've got the whole thing, it's in several Talmudic chapters. And uh, we get the whole numbers and how many uh, baths or how many uh, uh, cisterns he filled. And uh, I think that's paralleling this, uh, this materials here. I can't go into it uh, with you here, but it's in, it's in my book. You can look at it. It's extremely important. That's why I call the whole section on the New Testament code, Naktiban and Nicodemus. Naktiban is the is the is the is the Talmudic character, the rich man, and he has a friend. Remember, I told you, Ben Salva Sabul, also a rich man. <coughs> but this is a code, obviously. Now, Sabul means filth or immersed. Kala means dog. These are all rich men at this period in the town. Now look here. Now there was a certain rich man. Luke, uh, uh, well, 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 before that, Luke 14, Luke 16, 14, about the righteous and the unrighteous and the Pharisees who were greedy, scoffed at him, and you know they justified themselves before men, but God knows your heart uh, for the law and the prophets who are until John and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. Right, we'll, we'll just leave that for the moment. But Jesus says here in line 17 in Luke, as he says in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, I think you'll find it in Matthew 5.18, I think, I'm not sure. Uh, easier for the sky and earth to vanish than one bit of the law to fail. In other words, as Matthew puts it, not one jot of the law or tittle of the law will disappear until all these things are accomplished. Matthew this is Luke's variation of it much later here. Anyway, let's get to the thing I want to get to. Now there was a certain rich man, certain is always a very important uh, 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 adjective, like some, you have to always watch it. And he was clothed in purple and fine linen, and making merry every day in luxury. And uh, there was a certain poor man, not beggar, the word is poor man. Poor is the name of the sect that followed James the Ebionite. 
and it's going to be very important in John because Judas Iscariot complains about the women oiling and washing Jesus' feet and said, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? Judas Iscariot says. And what does Jesus reply? The poor you have with me always, but you do not always have me. Well, that's pretty arrogant. Uh, to That's like, again, yeah, Dionysus speaking. You know, yes, kiss my feet, oil my feet, do all these things. You know, I deserve it. I am a God, man. You know, that's how Dionysus would talk in Greco-Hellenistic literature. We like that. Those are, all these aphorisms are very attractive, but when you analyze them, it's not nice. And it isn't really say, well, why can't I glorify Jesus? Well, go ahead if you want. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying it's not nice. But in, in this case, Judas Iscariot is correct. But they heap abuse on Judas Iscariot. I'm not saying this was a historical episode. What I'm saying is there's an argument about the poor, James's community, and so on. But keep that in mind that it's the poor. Now, this is the poor man, and Lazarus is introduced to us. Now, we're going to meet Lazarus in the Gospel of John. And Lazarus is going to have two sisters, Mary and Martha. And we'll go to that next time. Let me see if I can do this one first. And he was laid at the porch, being full of sores. There's your full again. And desiring to be filled or satiated. The sabua thing. Now, I do this in much more detail, which is why that book went on to a thousand pages. From the crumbs which fell from the table of the rich man. Oh, there it is. The crumbs which fall from the table. That's the Mark thing. Now, it's been totally revised into a new episode, mixed with Talmudic materials about Ben Kabbalah Sabua. And I'll explain to you how. Uh, and even the dogs, oh, they don't come and eat the crumbs under the table. What do they do? Not door, I might be on. Uh, well, I used to yawn in all my classes. I, when I was at college, I fell asleep promptly at the beginning of every class and woke up at the end. Mm -hmm. Because it was winter time and the heat was always on in the, in the classrooms and the windows were always closed, and I'd, oh, I'd go in and go, <laughs> and I'd wake up, what do you say today? <laughs> so I, I don't mind people. I try to keep people awake. That's one of my great uh, attempts because of, I know I always fell asleep. And that's why I try to keep people awake. And part of keeping people awake is to entertain them, uh, not to be too dull, which is why I maybe overdo it on the entertainment side because of my college experience. I slept through every class from my sophomore year to my senior. I couldn't sleep through my calculus classes because uh, I would have flunked every test, but every other class, literature, uh, things, philosophy, you name it, I slept. <laughs> uh, I liked it, but I slept. Anyway, desiring to be filled from the dog crumbs that yet even the dogs came and licked his feet. Okay. Now, um, I claim, and I give it to you in my book, that this is based on the Talmudic definition of Ben Kaba Sabu's name. They say, well, why was he called Ben Kaba, Sab uh, ben Kaba Sabu, this rich man, you see? There's a certain rich man dressed in purple and fine linen. Why was he called Ben Kabo Samua? Because when you came to his door, and here's the door, uh, you know, um, uh, who was laid at his gate. When you came to his gate, when you came to his door, and by the way, laying in one of the previous ones, is in one of the previous episodes, laying, etc. Hungry as a dog, you went away filled. You came to his door hungry because they're playing on the kalba in his name. Kalba Kelab in Hebrew is dog. In Arabic and Aramaic also, and in, even in Arabic. So they're playing on his name. They're trying to, you know, you came to his uh, door hungry as a dog and went away filled. To my mind, that's what's being uh, uh, used here in this particular scenario. Uh, this is not Lazarus, I can assure you. He's not under any table and his feet are not being licked by dogs. The feet come from things like you will trample them with your feet and things like that and lots of other feet things that I show you in my, in my New Testament code book. You say, what are you talking about? I'm saying some of these people are just throwing these words up in the air and juggling them like you would play Scrabble. 
and coming down with a clever aphorism out of it. Just like you coming down with a clever word in your Scrabble playing. I know it's hard to imagine. Who would use a method like that? People who knew uh, traditions, who were having fun, who were, you know, uh, uh, marketing God-man stories, and were using sources that they considered ridiculous to begin with anyway, and were, you know, making incredibly interesting, uh, or, or tantalizing anyway, uh, aphoristic uh, 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 episodes. Now, uh, you, 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 you can think whatever you like, uh, but uh, you know, that's my whole chapter in my book, uh, The Dogs Who Lick Poor Lazarus for Souls. And one of the things I'm going to tell you in my book, which I can't cover in this class, in the letter called MMT, this is really secret stuff I'm giving you guys while I'm retiring, so no, you'll never hear it again, and no one else will give it to you either. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, I'm not worried about that, nor I'm, I am worried, but uh, since I've published it now, it'll be out there, it'll be probably forgotten, but someone maybe 200 years hence might well, thread it up or something, uh, and uh, have a benefit or profit from it. MMT. What's MMT? You guys know the scrolls. You know MMT? The letter. The letter, right. The letter that they found in the uh, scrolls that they held back for 35 years that we were sued for in Jerusalem and I ended up paying $60,000 in legal fees because the editor of the Little Archaeology Review uh, appended it to his publisher's forward without telling us when we didn't need it to put it in his publisher's forward because we had all the Hebrew documents in the book but he wanted lawsuits so that he could raise a stink in his magazine and sell more magazines. But he hung us out to dry. That's why people call, accused us of plagiarism, because supposedly we put this person's work who would have plagiarized anything. I never even know what's happening. I've never plagiarized anything in my life. I've never used anyone else's work. I don't rely on anyone else's work. And as I said in this book um, uh, that was written by Neil Asher Silberman, um, I forget what his book was called. Uh, but um, in any case, uh, he quoted my speech at the New York Academy of Sciences Conference. You know, uh, if you couldn't think, if you were, were to dream up a more ridiculous accusation, you couldn't have dreamed it up. Because you know, everyone knows I don't read their works. You know, I just, you know, call some aside. It's interesting, you know, uh, bookends. But, <laughs> you know, the opposite occurs. So, in any case, uh, it's because of this MMT thing. So, MMT is a really difficult thing, uh, a really difficult matter. And um, it was through the MMT thing that we broke the scroll monopoly because I had gotten a, uh, um, a uh, Zark's copy of it. And I said, the best way to, uh, from the people who were in the inner team working on it, I said, the best way to break the scroll monopoly in the late 80s, just pass this thing around to people who are not on the team. And it spread like wildfire. I just gave it to two or three people. And, by the time it was done, thousands of people had it, you know, and so on. And that's why they were all angry and, the, and this and that. And no one wanted anyone to know what was in this letter until they published it after holding it back for 35 years. Well, the point is that it's a letter directed to a king someplace. Really interesting. The only letter in the Cumberland Corpus. And there's, uh, you know, five or six uh, copies of it, so it's a very important letter. And it looks like it may be two letters, like one and two Corinthians or one and two Thessalonians. There's a first letter and a second letter. And the first letter refers to, or the letter refers to, at some point, a previous letter. And we don't know if the previous letter is the first part of it or if it's another letter, but I think the first part of it is the first letter and the second part of it is the second letter. And I published that in Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered and that's when they went after us and so on for having published it, etc. before they did. Uh, they didn't publish it until, um, you know, eight or nine years later. Their um, you know opus or whatever you call it, uh, print caps uh, edition, and you know, and uh, you can read what they made out of it. A, mush, a mishmash. They never understood any of it. All they could do, most of those guys on the official team, was grammar, grammar and philology. But they had no historical sense, no literary critical sense. You know, these are different skills. I may not be a, a good grammarian or philologist, but I'm a really good historian and a literary critic. But they don't know that because they're so ignorant that they think that they're geniuses. 
and that they don't think anyone else who doesn't do the things they do can know anything because they don't know anything about uh, literary criticism or history. And that's the whole struggle in scrolls. Ignorant people calling other ignorant people fools. Uh, that's really what it comes down to. And these ignorant people can go all the way. The most, the most ignorant are at Harvard and places like that. The higher the university, the more ignorant the, the, the people teaching there are because they only specialize in one little uh, 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 aspect of a given issue. And unless they're really intelligent people, uh, their mind doesn't go across broad uh, avenues of disciplines. So they don't do literary criticism. They have no idea of comparative uh, literary texts. They don't have any idea of, of history. None of them even knew uh, there was a James in early Christian history until I began to, uh, to, to beat on that subject uh, in the 1970s and 80s. They never even heard of him. How can you do Dead Sea Scrolls studies and not know the James Christianity group? The, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls call themselves Ebionites, call themselves the poor, don't they? All through the documents they refer to themselves as Ebionim, the poor. That's the name of James's party. The righteous teacher is the Tzaddik, the righteous one. Come on, James is called the righteous one. It may not be the same, but it's totally proud of you can't do this study without knowing those things. Ask Frank Moore Cross, the great uh, professor at Harvard. Did he know anything about uh, Jewish Christianity or James? Hardly a thing. He did Canaanite poetry 10 centuries before, and he's a Dead Sea Scroll expert. How could he be the Dead Sea Scroll expert without understanding all of Christianity and all of Josephus' work? He hardly even wrote Josephus. You know, it's, it's, and yet he, his word, he's the doyen, his word is God. And he puts his people in all the faculties across the country. That's the struggle we had. I don't have time for that. But let's look at how this ends up here. And he wanted to be fed from the crumbs that fell from the table of the rich man. And even the dogs came and licked his swords. Well, you see, the table of the rich man is from the previous one of the Canaanite women and so on. And uh, wanting to be filled, etc. Uh, they came to his door uh, hungry as a dog and went away filled. That's the Ben Kalba Sabua material. Now, you know, you have to decide which came first, the chicken or the egg, and which tradition is first here, but I submit to you this is playing off the Ben Kalba Sabua material. But the dogs is important in MMT, is what I was trying to say, because in the, as you go up, it gets into the camps in MMT. And it's a letter written to a king somewhere. I say the king is in northern Syria, as I, I try to make out in my book. They think it's written to one of the Herodian kings. The Herodian kings don't need this kind of um, this kind of tuition in Jewish law. It had to be a foreign convert, I say, of the king they're writing. So there's a famous letter in early Christianity called the Letter to Agabus, which is supposedly written by James to a king, uh, by Jesus to a king in northern Syria. I go into it in great detail in both of my James and my new book. But the point is, I say MMT to my mind is that letter to Agabus, and it's just been later on, um, you know, compressed uh, into. Uh, to James's instructions to overseas communities. You can find James's instructions to overseas communities in MMT. I, I tell you, you know, things, sacrifice to idols, uh, fornication, uh, uh, carrion is all there. Uh, stay away from, and it's there. Uh, to my mind, it's a Jamesian letter to um, this Northern Syrian king, but I make those arguments in both of my books. But let's finish here. Look at this. And the beggars died and was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Uh, not the beggar, the poor man died. And being in a torment of hell, he lifted up his eyes, and Abraham far off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Oh, that's from the Passover ceremony. For I am tormented in flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember you were fully received the good things in your lifetime, and Lazarus got the short end of the stick. But now he's comforted and you are suffering. And besides all these things, a great gulf has been fixed between you and us so that those who want to go from here to you cannot do so. I'm reading one translation. Nor can those come to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, you send them to the house of my father, for I have five brothers, so they may earnestly witness to them, so they may not come to this torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, if one should go to them from the dead, they will not repent. And he said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophet, they shall not believe, even if you, you should rise from the dead. So again, an attack on, Jew, on Jews, Judaism, uh, and so on and so forth, and Lazarus on the rich man's bosom, uh, you know, etc. Uh, that's how this all ends up, an attack on Jews, Judaism, and the law. Uh, yeah, well, well, it's not attacking. They don't listen to that. They're not going to certainly listen to me, who rose from the dead. 
the new God man who's coming uh, with the new salvation message, etc., etc., etc. But anyway, uh, you, you have to, uh, in the MMT, after all these things that are there, it talks about the camps in the wilderness and Jerusalem being chief of the camps. And then it says, you must bar the dogs from the wilderness camps because they may eat the flesh, or the bones rather, with the meat still on it. You must bar the dogs from the wilderness, because the camps must be utterly pure. You must bar the dogs from the wilderness camps because they will eat, they will eat the bones with the flesh still on it. I put all these together. And I said, that is the original that's being played off of. And that is actually the ban on carrion. Because carrion is eating the flesh of dead things. And that's the Jamesian ban on things sacrificed to idols in, 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 in Acts 15 and Acts 21. Anyway, it's all a complicated complex of traditions centering around the words dogs, table, crumbs, poor, filled. Can I think of anything else? Uh, and dog, oh yeah, I said dogs. And rich men. And rich men. And uh, I tease it all out in the New Testament. It's one of my most uh, complex analyses that I, that I try to do. That I can't do it in this class, but thanks for listening to me. I apologize for giving you a lot of things that don't seem to fall together. John next time, and I'll show you how John relates to Lazarus, because we've now introduced Lazarus. John and Lazarus, this is great stuff. Then we'll go to the resurrection and uh, the, uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection. So we will get through a lot of this.